by a man named John. Now, John, as a young man, he grew up in a, a very small rural town, um, very low population. They had a farm with raised cattle, and, and he had chickens he had to take care of while his dad worked the fields. He hated it there because he didn't really had to work hard. His dad had been in World War II, and after World War II, he, he went back, married his uh, sweetheart from the next county over. They, they lived a wonderful life. They, they had a farm themselves, and, and they, in fact, um, we go to church every Sunday, and they, they made their son go with them, and he hated that too. He was a very rebellious child, okay? Everything that they tried, he was just a guest. Um, well, time goes on, and, and the 60s come around, and he has now got the opportunity to go away to the city, to go to college, get away from this small town. And, you know, anybody that may have been in the 60s or knows about the 60s. That was an interesting time, right? There was well, anti-war protests, which really did not, his dad didn't like because obviously he was a veteran. Um, there was the civil rights movement. There was the psychedelic drugs, the psychedelic music, and weird outfits, and people dressing funny. Well, he got into that crowd, okay? And he goes back home one day, and his parents, oh my God, look at the way he's dressed. Look at the way his hair, look at him. What's happened? You're, you're like, look like the devil. Goes to church, everybody's looking at him and gossiping, and he gets mad. This is why I don't go to church. These people are all so judgmental. His parents told him he was going to hell unless he changed the way he looked and the way he acted. Well, he got mad. He said, I'm never speaking to you again, and he never did for the rest of his life. Never spoke to his parents ever again. When he goes back to Kenton City, and he meets this really beautiful young girl. And she comes from a small country town as well. She's a good girl. You know, she's a, a born-again Christian, god fairy, goes to church every Wednesday, twice on Sunday. She's a good girl, right? Um, and they meet. Now, he has become an atheist, totally against anything to do with God. They fall in love. Like, this is going to really work, you know? Um, and they ended up having a son. See, she was, uh, Danny wanted to get away from the, the country life as well. She wanted to, to see the big city lights. You know, she wanted to get to where all the people in the action were. And when they had their son, that kind of changed things for her. Um, her John, he really just tried to stub his atheistic views on his family. You know, like, there is no such thing as God. Everything that you're going to have in life is because you make it, and this is all you have, and once this is done, it's it. So you make the best of it now. You work hard, and then you get rewarded. Well, um, they got to a point that one day, when uh, Tommy was about 10, his uh, friend from school invited him to a church picnic. Now, he'd never been on a picnic before, much less a church picnic. He didn't even know what a church was, really. And this is kind of interesting to him, so he asked his mom, Hey, Mommy, can I go? with Billy to this church picnic. Well, she thought it'd be a great idea. Might help. Um, she said, whatever you do, don't tell your dad. Because, you know, he'll be really, really mad, right? So, she, uh, he goes, and he has a wonderful time, and meets some friends. He even got to hear about Jesus for the first time. He got to hear about God, and he was really excited when the little boy's parents dropped him off. Uh, his dad was sitting there in the yard, standing in the yard, because he found out. He was angry. You know, um, the boy comes to the house, I'd like to say he was sent to, to his room and, um, for the rest of the night. But that isn't what happened. Uh, see, John became a drunk. And he took his anger and bitterness out of his son to the point that he couldn't go to school for a few days because of what people would say. Now, Tammy, on the other hand, she's been, she's dealing with it. She stopped going to church. She didn't go to church anymore. She very rarely read her Bible. And she would always stand uh, in the gap for her husband because she remembered one time what she was told, wives, submit yourself to your husbands as you would submit to the Lord. But see, the problem was is that she didn't fully understand what this meant. And Tammy, she stuck it out as long as she could. But finally, she got divorced. She had to leave for her own safety and the safety of her child. She ran, didn't tell uh, John exactly anything where he's at. Now he's all alone in the house. He has no wife, he has no son. He don't speak to his family anymore because they, they, 
They dance everything they are. So his whole life turned upside down. And to make things worse for him, <clears throat> he couldn't get old of any of them. Couldn't talk to his son anymore. Didn't know where he went. And Tommy, by the age of 16, suddenly has these ideology issues about life and everything. And it's, it becomes so distressing. He gets depressed. He goes, he gets in the hospital and he even tries to commit suicide. Now, things are really out of control. But Tommy gets his life together. He's moving along. He ends up moving with his grandparents. And mind you now, this is the 80s. Okay? People dressed funny then too. Okay? The styles have changed. The music has changed. The hairstyles. Oh, wow. You know, everything was different. So, he meets this young girl, and they start dating, and she invites him to go to church one day. He looks at her and laughs, and says, you know, because this is what he believed in when his dad had been so down him so much. Why would you go to church? There's no such thing as God. Is your life so miserable, and you're so desperate to, for happiness that you have to turn to religion? Now, Amy... She's a good Christian. And she knows that the Bible says you must be ready at any given time to stand firm and to, to give testimony of why you believe what you believe. And she says, first of all, um, religion and God are not the same thing. And even if they were, uh, desperation has nothing to do with whether God exists or not. See, you live as though God doesn't exist, right? She said, what do you mean? She said, well, I mean that you certainly don't live life as if he does exist, because if you did, you would treat people and you look at things differently than you do. And maybe you would have this joy and peace and contentment in your life that you're so desperately looking for. You see, you're so stressed out. And God says, Come to me, Jesus said, come to me, all who are weak, they're tired, they're heavy, they're, they're, they're just worn out, and they're, they just feel so low, and he says, I will give you rest. Well, he ends up going to church with her, partly to shut her up, but mainly because he was curious. You know, what is, what is this whole Jesus and God thing really about, and what if she's actually right? So he goes to this church, and it's not like the church that he went to when he was little. There was lots of people. Of course, he was 10 years old. And uh, this church, there was about 30 people in there. And as soon as he walks in, every single person in that church turned their heads. They looked at him, and they whispered and, and smiled. And then they went right on to service. He was running a little late. Now, even the preacher, he knew that he was, he was new. And it wasn't because of um, that he'd never seen him before. It was because of the way he dressed. He wore these red spandex pants, and bright red jacket with a yellow shirt, yellow socks, and red shoes. I mean, I mean, it was great. His hair was really wild. It was one of them flock of seagulls wild, for those who know who I'm talking about. Okay? He was noticed. Well, everybody looking at him made him feel really uncomfortable. He sat down in the back of the church. He really didn't listen to the message because he just felt uncomfortable, like everybody was judging him for this. And, and on the ride home, he was talking to Amy, and she said, how do you like it? He goes, that ah, yeah, is all right. She goes, oh, well, what do you think about it? He goes, well, all these Christians, they're so darn judgmental. She goes, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, they're all looking at me and judging. And what happened to this where it says, do not judge? You shouldn't be judging others, or whoever casts them, Without sin, cast that first stone. Whatever happened to that? All you Christians are so judgmental. She explained to him in the, the loving way that she could that not all Christians are judgmental. And, and those people in that church were not judging you. Yes, they saw you, but they were not judging you. And he, she calmed him down, and he decided to go back next week. And, and when he returned, um, he got there a little early. This time, he was prepared. He's wearing a bright yellow shirt. Bright yellow suit this time. Looks like Big Bird. Okay? His hair this time looked like um, James Brown and Prince got into a fight. Okay? So, 
The preacher sees him. The preacher comes up and walks straight over to him. You know what he says to him? He says to him, Brother, I am so glad you joined us again today. You came back. We are so happy here. You're, you have been, you're so welcome here. You've been the talk of the church. And, and Tommy's like, oh, what am I thinking about my wet look? He says, uh, what is it about? He goes, well, you, everybody knows you're new. You, Amy told us that you've never knew about God or Jesus. And you're brand new to the church family, to the body of Christ. And that makes you the most important person here in this church. Never once did he ever say anything about the way he dressed and the way he looked. Never once did anyone in that church say anything to him about the way he looked or dressed. At least not until he started having his own kids come to that church. And believe me, they really dressed funny at that point. Okay? And they just their other members the old time. Hey, you remember how you walked in here with that mm, hair thing You know? You know, let's face it. God can change anyone. He can make the, the weak strong. He can change it sometimes quick, sometimes it takes a while. But he can change anyone. Sometimes change can scare people. You know, we get comfortable in the way things are. We like things just the way they are. But change can be scary at times. Sometimes we see someone or something and it just, it, it, it just, it just gets us all wired up. And, and if we're not careful, um, things can become running out of our mouths that we really don't mean to say. And we've often heard that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth shall speak. And we, our, our words can are very strong and powerful tools. They can they can build somebody up, they can tear them down. You can encourage somebody or you can discourage them. You can heal them with your words. You can hurt them. The gossip and slander and backstabbing just runs rampant through the world. And why is this? It's because we're all broken people. We've all got flaws. And when Jesus was asked, why are you sitting there eating with all these sinners, he simply looked at them and said, it's not the healthy that needs a doctor. No, no. It's the sick. I did not come here for the righteous. I came here for the sinners. That's why I'm here right now. Now, the question is, who needs Jesus? Who needs him? Well, I say everybody. Everybody needs Jesus. And most of us say that too. You know, because Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody gets to that Father except through me. So that tells me everybody needs Jesus, even those that don't think they do. And we are told not to judge. Do not judge. And this is probably three words that are so misquoted in the Bible of anything that is there. And most people will be completely disregard the text or the context of what is, how it's being used. What Jesus was actually saying is do not judge, or you too will be judged. And interesting enough, most people are, are trying to use this as a silencing technique to say, hey, you have no right to tell me what to do. You have no right to tell me how I live my life or I'm wrong. Judge not. And I guess if you were to isolate this part of the, the scripture, these three little words, it would seem to... Um, obviate all the negative assessments that are, are being portrayed into the do not judge type of situation. However, there is much, much more to this passage than just these three little words. Just because the Bible says do not judge, it does not mean we shouldn't use discernment. Now, there is a big difference between being using discernment and judgment. It says don't waste your time on what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. And he goes on a little further on to say, it says, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruits, by the way they act. 
Can you pick grapes from a thorn bush or figs from a thistle? And see, it is sometimes hard to, to determine who those pigs or dogs and false prophets are. But you can by looking at the way their lives are. By if they're following a doctrine and if they're preaching something and they're actually doing it. If I'm, if, if, if I'm sitting here going, brothers and sisters, you know, you should be safe, sober, or don't get drunk, be a drunkard. And yet, tomorrow night I'm sitting in the bar and getting drunk. That's not good. That's a false prophecies. That's somebody that's teaching you wrong. That person needs to go. Jesus has given us permission to, to use discernment to see what is right from wrong. And we just need to understand a few things. First of all, superficial judgment is wrong. Judging somebody the way they look is completely wrong. John 7 says, stop judging by mere appearance, but instead judge correctly. And if you're looking at the King James Version, it says, judge righteously. And Proverbs tells us, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. And if you look at the NLT version, I like this version, it says, spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. At this point, if this is something that you've just done, you're not shaming and being disrespectful um, to that person anymore. You're going to total disregard to God and His Word and what He's teaching. Because God says we are not supposed to judge others for their appearance. It is foolish to jump to conclusions without investigating all the facts first. And this can be a big one. Hypocritical judgment. Ah. You know, Jesus commands us not to judge in Matthew 7, 1, do not judge others, or yes, you will be judged. It proceeded with the, a comparison to hypocrites. Where, and, and if you give, like, if you give money to someone, or you help somebody out, you don't want to sit there, you don't tell everybody, hey, look what I've done. I just donated all this money to this charity. I just did this. I did that. What do you hear happening here? It's a me, me, me pride. Okay, we, that is something to you and the Lord. You don't need to advertise it to the person. Hey, I, I sent you this, I gave you this, I gave you that. No. That's, that's, that's that pride thing sneaking in. And when you pray for someone, or if you're standing in the church and you're asked to pray, and you stand up there and go, Oh, Lord, for thou art the one, blah, 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 it's so poetic. That's not right. You're not there to entertain the people. What are you there for? You're there to worship and pray to God. You sit down and you just look at nobody's there. It's just you, God, your heart, and you speak the truth from your heart. That's a, a solid prayer. I learned that from Brother Jimmy. When you fast or you give up something, you don't want to look all blase on your face. <sighs> so hungry. But I'm doing this for the Lord. Now you're just getting sympathy from everybody. See, again, you do these things because you want something. Um, and then, uh, many people will point out other people's sins, right? And that they themselves are still sinners or maybe even doing. And this is completely hypocritical. Um, <clears throat> now, what is wrong if you point out somebody's sin? Um, you know, you got to remember, the Bible says, before you pull the speck out of someone else's eye. You need to take the plank out of your own. Look at yourself. Or as Michael Jackson said, I'm going to start with the man in the mirror. And that's where it begins. So if you've actually done any of these things and, and, uh, or doing these things, shame on you! What is wrong with you? Don't do that. That is not what God tells us to do. Jesus would not be happy with us. And we do these type of things, we're not, we, we're not condemning ourselves. Now, we have no excuse whatsoever to pass any type of judgment on anybody else. That is God's job. Are you God? Do you know better than him? I don't think so. And what about the, this harsh and unforgiving judgment that we put on people? Oh, uh, you don't like you. Uh, you're different. I don't like you. Okay, this is wrong. And just in case you were wondering, we are to slander no one. 
to be peaceful and considerate and always be gentle towards every single person that we meet. We do this with love. It is the merciful that he shows mercy on. And, and Jesus warned, for the same way you judge others, you too will be judged. And with the measure that you use on others, that too will be the way you measure up as well. <coughs> and this is a good one. That's so righteous judgment. I'm holier than thou, I'm better than you, I'm a good Christian, I do nothing wrong. No, God opposes the proud. He shows favoritism to the humble. It's just like the Pharisee and the tax collector. Remember that story? Have you ever heard of the Pharisee and the tax collector story? It's okay if you don't. I'll give you a really quick explanation. There's a Pharisee and the tax collector that was sitting in the church and in the synagogue and they were praying to God. And the Pharisee, he says, Thank you, Lord. Thank God. I am not like that sinner over there. Tax collector, he was down on his knees, he was crying, he had tears going down his face, and he said, Lord, forgive me, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my wrongdoings. And the Lord blessed that tax collector, but he didn't bless that Pharisee. Why? Because God opposes the proud. But he the man was so humble. He blessed him. It's the humble that he's seeking. You know, the untrue judgment. That is another bad one. People say, oh, I'm going to tell this a little bit. Here, this is the whole picture, but I'm only going to tell you this piece of it because, you know, I'm not going to tell you how it happened, but I'm going to tell you this piece of it. Okay? And now you create a false truth. There was a, a, a gentleman um, who was uh, an actor back in 2018, 19, around there, who, uh, Jesse something. He, he was on the show Empire. And he claimed that at 2 o'clock in the morning in Chicago that he was walking down the street and two white men in red mega hats jumped in and beat him and put a rope around his neck and he used to hate crime like it was a racial crime and, a, and because he was gay. And it turns out later on that that was never true. If he actually hired two of his friends to betray these two people and beat him up. You see, the Bible says false witnesses will not go unpunished, and whoever pours out lies will not go free. And you know what happened to Jesse? He went to jail. I won't finish that rest of the story what happened because it's still ongoing. But, you know, we are to slander no one. Just because we want to prove our point. We can't we should never use God or anyone else to try to do this. Okay, if you have a right and beliefs, you need to stand on it with what is true and the facts, not just what you feel and, and try to falsify something to get an agenda for yourself. We're supposed to be peaceable and considerate and always being gentle toward every single person you meet. Christians are often judging others on their intolerance and speak up against that sin. You're a sinner, you're going to hell, you need to turn your life to Jesus Christ, you need fire insurance. And this is wrong. You know, we, we're not opposing, uh, see, opposing sin is not wrong at all, okay? Holding steadfast to the righteousness naturally de defines um, what we believe in. Um, and the unrighteousness of, of sin, we, we stay away from that. But we're not going to sit there and yell at people, okay? Standing on the street corner yelling at somebody is not a way to win them over to Jesus. Believe me, you start yelling at me, I'm not going to listen to you. This won't be me. Forget it. I don't hear you. In fact, I'm now at this point thinking about what I'm going to say back. I'm not even listening to you anymore, right? Because now we've started this big argument and a fight, and that's just foolishness. We need to stay away from that stuff. We need to have that peace and that love and the kindness. You know, Jesus didn't stand up there and yell and scream at the people. He talked to them with love. <clears throat> we're not supposed to be judging people on their appearance, but we're supposed to be judging with right judgment. And believers are warned against judging others unfairly. Okay, but we still need, can't judge rightly. Okay, and we use this discernment. 
<clears throat> we're supposed to test everything and hold fast to what is good, what is true, what is the word of God. And we are to be, uh, preach the word and be ready in and out of season for any situation to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And with complete patience, mind you. Not that we are, but we're supposed to be very patient with this and we're supposed to be teaching. It's just like Amy did in the story I was telling you when Tommy was going on about how God is this and that and people and they had his own opinions of what he believed and perceived things to be. Right? So he, she was very patient with him. She rebuked, she rebuked, and, and she exhorted God and, and she taught him that, you know, there is a better way. But she did it not with forcefulness. She did it with love and speaking in the truth in love. We are, we grow and to become in every respect of our, our body and our maturity and our spirituality. We grow to be more like him and who is the, the head of our, the, the body of the church. The body of Christ is Jesus Christ himself. And you see, our church is at this crossroad right now. We are at a point where we're standing at the Red Sea, okay? Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. The, the Israelites, had, they wanted to get away from the Egyptians, right? You know, the slavery and all this stuff. And they're taking off. They're moving right along. But now they come up to the Red Sea with God told them to just wait. And the Pharaoh's army is now barreling down the back of them, right? Coming at them. And now they're, they're starting to complain. They're scared, right? They're, they're like, oh, my God, what have you done to us, Moses? What have you done? Wasn't there enough graves in, the, in Egypt that we that now you have to send us to the desert to die? What is wrong with you? Now, if you don't believe that those are the words that were said, read Exodus 14. Those are the exact words that the people were yelling at him. But Moses, he had gotten a word from the Lord, and the Lord, and he said, the Lord will fight for you. You just simply need to be still. Wait on the Lord. It's kind of like that dream I had. I told you about uh, a while back. Where the, you're waiting, I'm in the boat. And I'm going across the lake. The wind blows, I'm stuck. I stop rowing, I drift across the lake. Long story short, that is. It's the same thing. You know, we've done the work. We've, we've been out there. We've been, we're talking to people. But, you know, things are changing. People are changing. And, and it can be scary. Are we going to allow the enemy to fight and yell and get come down upon us? Or are we going to stand there with Moses, raise our arms, let the sea open up, and we cross on dry land in the glorious uh, safety of the Lord? And let him do the fight for you? Just be still. Things are changing. Things are going to change. So that maybe... You know, days, maybe years, maybe lifetimes. But it will, it does happen. Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and covered and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. See, we are all God's children. And when we choose to follow God and rest in him and be still and let him give us that comfort and that peace, there's a joy beyond all joy. And it comes beyond all of our own understanding. And see, we were chosen long before we chose him. And that's how it is for the disciples. And that's how it is for you. That's how it is for me. That's how it is for all of us. He knows what you, you can be. And you know who you can help. Who can make that impact? And is those people that are, would be thrilled to see you when they, they see you walking up? That they're the ones you could would, could invite and tell them about Jesus. And you know who else they are? They're those kids at school that everybody knows. You know, I'm talking about the ones that people look at and kind of mm, different. Okay, those that are too shy to engage with others. Those that are struggling with depression uh, and the ones who, the, the, the person that keeps to themselves, that is kind of isolated and quiet. That kid that kind of dresses funny too, you know? Those are the ones. And I'm talking about 
the person that the low end of the popularity spectrum. That's what I'm talking about. And I'm talking about that person who you know will, that you will lighten up their world just if you just approach them and talk to them and say, Hi, how are you? Jesus, the Son of God himself, came to the blind, he came to the lame, he came to the lepers, came to those who were possessed, the deaf, the poor. Jesus came to the least of humanity. So who, who can I help? <coughs> Do you want to love people by helping them to become followers of Jesus? That's a pretty cool thing. We're in this lifeboat. The ship is sinking. That's the world. The ship is sinking. And we're in a lifeboat. We've got plenty of room in this boat. And I you don't know, like you. Go ahead, drown. But Jesus is always there. He said, hey, 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 wait a minute. That's the child. That's your brother here. What's wrong with you? You'll pick them up. Go where you can be an influence. And if you don't, and if, if you want to know God, to know Jesus and start a new life. It is really <coughs> simple. You see, God sent his son to this world. Um, that whoever believes in him, they shall not perish, but they'll have eternal life. He did not come here to condemn the world. He came to that the world might be saved through him. Because whoever believes in <coughs> him, they're, they're not condemned, they're saved. But whoever does not believe, Stands condemned already, but they do not believe in the one and only true Son of Jesus Christ, uh, or Lord God, and that is Jesus Christ. And understand this, John 3, 3 says, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Praise the straight forward. Now, if you're ready to be a part of the kingdom of God, all you have to do is pray with me right now this simple prayer. Say, Father God, forgive me of my sins. I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. I believe he died for my sins and you rose him again. I accept Jesus into my heart as my Lord and Savior. I thank you for my redemption. In Jesus' name, I pray. And if you prayed that little prayer, and we believe that you are born <coughs> again, you are part of the the body of Christ. Get yourself into a Bible-based church. Um, don't forget about the repenting and, and get baptized. That is extremely important. And remember, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice.